Stargate Voyager. I think we're looking again at a lost technology. And it was this ancient apocalypse 12,800 years ago that wiped that from the human memory banks. Why were these ancient elongated skulled peoples or humanoids of Malta living underground? Now I believe we're talking prior to 9700 BC for the original construction of the Sphinx. And they were what some people have called giants, probably no more than seven to eight feet tall. And those giants have been pulled out of American mounds. Whether it's the colossal statue heads that have been unearthed, to all the strange artifacts you've been showing in the museums, to some of the strange features they seem to possess, the more I learn about the Olmec culture, uh, really the more fascinated I become. I want to invite you to join us on one of our upcoming tours this spring and summer. We've got Egypt coming May 8th through the 19th. We're going to have a private visit inside the Great Pyramid. We're going to see the Great Sphinx of Giza up close. We're going to go underground and see these massive boxes in the Serapium. We're going to see these colossal megalithic statues. And we are going to look for evidence of lost ancient technology all over Egypt. June 30th through July 6th, we're going to be in England. We're going to have a private visit in Stonehenge. We're going to go inside crop circles and uh, fathom the phenomenon. We're going to go inside ancient megalithic burial chambers. We are going to consider the legends of ancient giants. And it's going to be an England trip uh, unlike no other. In August, we've got the Peru and Bolivia tour. Go to Machu Picchu. We're going to go to Sacsayhuaman and see these colossal 100 ton plus walls. We're going to see elongated skulls. We're going to dip into Bolivia and go to Puma Punku and see these H blocks and all of the strange humanoid statues. I hope you'll join us. Go to stargatevoyager.com slash tours to register. Well, I am really excited to be joined by a special guest today. I've got researcher and filmmaker Chad Riley uh, on with me today. He is the uh, creator of a new documentary called Skinwalkers and Stranger Things of the Unseen Realm. Chad, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, Derek, and your uh, your uh, followers as well. And I uh, look forward to getting into some of this with you today. Yeah, it's going to be great. We're going to talk about, as the title of your documentary says, Skinwalkers, especially Skinwalker Ranch. Because you, you go deep in that, the history of it. Um, we're going to get into talking about some strange artifacts found on top of Mount Hermon uh, that might relate to Genesis 6 and the Nephilim. And you even connect to uh, Atlantis and um, the Nazis of all things. So it's going to be a crazy uh, episode. But Chad, tell us a little bit about your journey that brought you to this place where you are dedicating a lot of time to researching not just these topics, but creating a two and a half hour long documentary about uh, these incredible topics. Yeah, um, I mean, I, you know, I started out doing the uh, radio show, Deception Detection Radio, did that for about four and a half years, and then slowly but surely got into making documentaries, uh, worked on the Hollow Earth Chronicles, Episode 1, The Dark Chambers, uh, did a little bit of work on Belly of the Beast, and also uh, Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes. So this is my first standalone film that I've done completely all on my own. Um, and started out just trying to do a documentary on Skinwalker Ranch. That, that's all I was going to do. And as you can see, the, uh, the research quickly ran in about a million different directions and uh, saw that so much of the stuff was all interconnected that uh, by the time I got done with my research, I had about 480 pages of notes that I had to whittle down to about 88 pages and uh, still came out right at about two and a half hours or two hours and 32 minutes. So, yeah, it, uh, it was definitely uh, probably one of the most epic journeys I've been on. It took me a year and a half to make. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, finally here. It's finally out for everybody to enjoy. It's crazy. Like you said, you start researching a topic and, you know, because you want to be thorough and you just start going down all these other rabbit trails that connect like in your case, you're talking about Skinwalker Ranch. But like you said, there's so many things that connect. 
a year and a half actually sounds pretty short to me. I'm I'm surprised it only took you a year and a half to create this huge documentary. Um, so thank you for creating it. And just tell our listeners before we get into this up close, where can they find the documentary that we're going to talk about? Where can they buy it and follow you and all that good stuff? Well, I'm hopeful or I'm hoping that you're going to put the link in the description box so that people can click on that. But if they can't, if there's no no link for them to click on, I would just say go to Google and type in Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O, and then type in Skinwalkers and Stranger Things of the Unseen Realm. And you should find it. It should come up. It'll be the one that says True Seekers Research. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so everybody look for that. Give it a watch. And uh, again, two and a half hours. Chad goes deep on so many topics. So let's kind of, um, I've got a handful of questions to ask you about it. And we can go in, in any direction we want. So as you're, as I'm starting to watch your documentary, near the beginning, something really caught my attention. And again, the the title of your documentary is Skinwalkers and Stranger Things of the Unseen Realm. And that's such a great title because... Stranger Things obviously dovetails with the hit um, show that's been on Netflix for a while. But as I'm watching this, you have this piece at the beginning where you're talk as you're setting up this whole film. You mentioned kind of briefly how in 1869, there was a British explorer um, who climbs up Mount Hermon and finds something. And I'll let you tell us what he found. But I had never heard this. It fascinated me. So tell us more about this, what he found, and how it relates to uh, Genesis 6 and the Watchers and the Nephilim. Sure. I believe it was uh, Sir Charles or Edwin, um, who was the police chief in London at the time during the Jack the Ripper murders, who was also a, uh, a Mason. And um, he was exploring... Um, for the Palestine government uh, going around out there exploring. And he found a ancient temple. Uh, probably, the, in fact, it is the highest known temple of worship that they've ever found on the planet. And I believe it's called Kassar Antar uh, is the name of it. And inside this temple, they found a, a stone with uh, ancient Greek on it. And they translated it and it said those who take an oath proceed from here and um, I present a very compelling case that this ties in with the watchers that came down in, in the days of Jared the 200 fallen angels commando unit that came down to blot out the coming messiah and uh, that was their mission was to try to blot out the coming messiah and make God a liar and that was the thing is that the Simyaza their leader uh said that, you know, I'm afraid that you guys aren't going to, you know, you're not going to take this oath or whatever and stuff. And so they all swore an oath and uh, uh, swore the, uh, swore an oath under this curse that uh, they would all be guilty of this sin. A lot of my research is, you know, we're talking ancient history, prehistory. So obviously that dovetails into Genesis 6, the book of Enoch that you referenced. And for those who may not know, the book of Enoch goes in depth on what Genesis 6, 4 mentions kind of in passing about these ancient giants, these Nephilim. And so Enoch breaks down how it all started with these, what we would call watchers, these fallen angels that somehow descend to earth, breed with human women, right? But Enoch says how they came to Mount Hermon, highest peak there in, in Israel or the Middle East. And they make this oath, right? That we are going to do this no matter what. And it was kind of like the original genetic experiment, right? Creating this hybrid race that breeds them out. And so to me, it's fascinating in your film how we might have some, some kind of archaeological evidence that could back that up, right? Because um, it's this, this like four foot Stella and you show pictures of it with these ancient inscriptions and here we've got this this 1800s British explorer finds this, and the inscriptions pretty much describe what they said in the Book of Enoch. You know, we're going to make this vow and we're going to do this. So I, I found that fascinating because you get into a lot about what Blavatsky said about the Aryans and how they were 
uh, related to the Atlanteans. So why don't you give us a little background on who this Blavatsky is that you, you quote several times in the documentary and why that's important to set up what she knew about the Aryans and how they might have been related to the Atlanteans who, according to reports, were giants. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, Helena Blavatsky uh, was a early researcher and uh, explorer who traveled the world going through ancient manuscripts, ancient texts, and wrote several books. Um, the book in question that we're talking about is her book, The Secret Doctrine, Volume 2. And inside that book, she gets into a lot of this stuff, but she also talks about an ancient Tibetan uh, manuscript that she had translated called the Book of Dizion. And inside the Book of Dizion, it talks about the Atlanteans. And it has a specific uh, part in there, I think it stands at 11, where it talks about uh, they built statues the, the height of their bodies. And it says that they were nine yachties high. Well, a yachty translates to a meter or three feet. So three times nine is 27 feet tall, which directly ties these individuals in with Genesis 6 and the Nephilim. So that's you got that right there. And um, after, you, you know, you go that route, you're looking at that. Well, that's that's where I get into the whole thing about the, the Nazis. Um, you know, everybody thinks it was about eugenics, that this was about the race war, that they wanted to be pure white, pure Aryan. Well, it's pure Aryan, but it's not what people are thinking. It has nothing to do with eugenics. It does to a degree, but it's they were tapping into the ancient bloodlines. The, the Nephilim bloodlines. This is what they this is what they were interested in. They wanted to tap into their Nephilim bloodlines. And uh, they wanted the powers that go along with that. I mean, they were reading books like the, the Coming Race, where they were talking about these people that lived inside the earth that wielded a power called Vril. And this power was so devastating that a child, in fact, if I remember correctly, it says something about a child who had the power of Vril, uh, just if they didn't keep it in check, if they just got upset, they could decimate an entire army, one child. That's how powerful this, this is. So this is what they believe. This is what they totally bought into Blavatsky's uh, root race theology that she talks about. In fact, uh, in the, the seven root races that she talks about, it was the first two root races, they weren't even human. They were something else. They, they, they were, and if you read it and look at it, it talks about like these spiritual beings. So, I mean, seriously, it's like when you, when you start looking into the ancient world, especially stuff like pre-Adamic, you start getting into the gap theory, the pre-Adamic, and then you start getting into six day, uh, six day man before Adam and Eve, because most people, they don't even know that the Bible talks about two creation accounts in there. When you're reading Genesis, there's two separate creation accounts. It said God created men and women, told them to be fruitful and multiply. But then it starts over. It says God then created Adam. Adam was unique. He put Adam in the garden. Adam lived by himself with the animals for an extended period of time. We don't know exactly how long that was. But there was an extended period of time where he lived just among the animals. Then finally, one night he went to sleep. He took a rib and created Eve. So like I said, there's a whole plethora of time that most people are not even fully aware of. Reading the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2, you got the whole thing about the Tohu Bohu, which is how we get into the whole thing about the gap theory and pre-Adamic. Give us a little bit more on the gap theory and why you believe there's credence to this theory that the earth is far, maybe far older than we've been told or led to believe. Me and uh, Timothy Alberino, we've talked several times. One of the conversations that we had through his uh, connection with Ansel P. Rambla, who's done research into the Chincana and all that, there are pre-Adamic sites underneath some of these megalithic sites. Uh, I'm sure you probably you probably already know this. You probably heard this. You probably even talked to Timothy about this. But that's the thing is that there there are pre-Hedemic sites that are far ancient than these megalithic sites like Machu Picchu and and so on. It's like you know the, those sites those sites alone are staggering and mind blowing. But you know it's like what is underneath it? Like Petra Jordan, for example, only eighty five percent of Petra is even has been excavated. 
you know, uh, or I mean, fifteen percent has been excavated. Eighty-five percent of it is still underground, and nobody's ever even seen it. And that's the way a lot of these ancient sites are. So, like I said, the deeper you go, the the more the older it gets. And like I said, you quickly pass, go past the whole uh, megalithic stuff, and you start getting into what they call pre-Adamic. Now, the the Chincon that Ansel P. Rambla talked about. This thing travels all the way from Bolivia to Peru to the Amazon rainforest. And even uh, what was it? Uh, Timothy had alluded. He believes it actually goes all the way under the ocean straight to Antarctica. And I mean, when you hear Ansel P. Rambla talking about this, this A-frame type tunnel, he said this tunnel was so big. You could take two of those red double-decker buses in England, put them side by side, and they could drive nonstop to wherever this thing however far it goes but we know that it goes all the way out past amazon rainforest yeah yeah and and so this this tunnel chad's talking about is um supposed to be under the city of cusco and the crown jewel of cusco is this site called the cori concha which is this incredible megalithic temple i was just there in october and it was one of the most fascinating things to see um, but for those that have really researched it, and Chad's referencing this this guy named Anson P. Rambla, he actually got permission years ago to go underneath this. And to his amazement, he found what the legends of the Inca had said, that there was a massive tunnel, not just a tunnel carved into bedrock, but a, a dressed, finished megalithic tunnel that ran at least from that site miles up to Sac Sebaman, one of the most amazing megalithic sites in Peru. But um, these megalithic tunnels, or if you want to call it pre-edemic, um, are said to go, like like uh, Chad said, forever under the ground and connect cities all over. So is that an example of uh, pre-edemic architecture? Maybe. Um, but I guess the whole gap theory is a, a discussion for another day. Crazy uh, rabbit trail we could go down, but I want to get back to um, a Blavatsky and the Aryans. This is such an incredible topic. So Blavatsky, she predated Hitler and stuff. That was what, a couple of decades before? And yeah, so in fact, uh, you, had, uh, you had Aleister Crowley looked into her research. I mean, a lot of people followed her research, but like I said, the Nazis latched onto it about the root race theology part of it and talking about the Aryans, that they were the descendants of the Atlanteans. And so whenever they saw the thing in there about the Book of Dizion and how the Atlanteans were 27 feet tall and the Aryans were their descendants, that's what they and they believe that they were the remnant descendants of the Aryans. So that's that's where this is all was actually going towards. And they had their various branches that they had on an urbe, which was like their archaeologists that traveled the planet looking through ancient manuscripts and also looking for archaeological artifacts and so on. And those were the ones that most people are familiar with that we were over in Tibet and they were. Uh, hanging out with the monks. In fact, they brought back almost 200 monks and uh, made them SS officers. Uh, you know, there, there's so much about the Nazis that wow. most people have never even heard of and are not even aware of. So, yeah. So, so Blavatsky was a leading occultist of her day. Yes. And so she had done crazy research and found all these ancient texts and basically wrote these books um, talking about you know, these ancient races, but, but you're saying, you know, when people hear the word Aryan, they're thinking, you know, these are the people that the Nazis wanted to be just this white skin, blue eyed race. You're saying it's way more than that. They were trying to tap into the Atlantean or Nephilim bloodline. So tell us more about that and then talk more about these artifacts they were trying to hunt down. And then yeah, I want to ask, go ahead. Yeah. The, uh, the the Nephilim bloodlines, I'm sure you probably uh, know, you're probably familiar with Fritz Springermeyer's research, the 13 bloodlines and so on. And that's the thing is that there are still remnants of the Nephilim bloodlines uh, that live among us today. You know, these are the most elite, wealthy people that you don't really hear a whole lot about. They're never in the news. You never see them on TV or anything like that. Most of the time, their names never even appear in print. 
anywhere because they are just that they're that powerful. Um, but again, they believe that they were part of this as well, not just those 13 bloodlines, but that they were the direct descendants and that they had came from the, the Aryans. So that's what they were tapping into and what they, they were trying to prove. But as far as like traveling the planet, they were looking for all sorts of ancient artifacts. They were looking for the Ark of the Covenant, which we saw in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, they, they talk about that, but they were looking for lots of different uh, ancient artifacts and not just stuff that had to do with Christ, but uh, other artifacts that, um, you know, known to be supernatural that might have even had to do with fallen angels and, and stuff like that. So they, they pretty much everywhere all over the planet, they even went down to uh, New Schwaben's land in Antarctica. Um, I believe it was Admiral Donuts that uh, said that they had built an impregnable fortress down there for him. And in fact, that uh, when Hitler supposedly was murdered uh, or killed himself in, uh, over there at the end of World War II, uh, the FBI had documents saying that, that he had made it to Argentina. Well, what's the significance of him making it to Argentina? Well, when you know about the Chincana and all that, you know, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump. You can travel underground all the way straight to Antarctica. So it's very fascinating. Yeah. Years ago, I watched that Hunting Hitler uh, documentary by the History Channel. And we know the History Channel is pretty mainstream now. Uh, but even the evidence they seemed to produce in that documentary seemed pretty over the top that man what were all these nazis doing in argentina like there is whole people that look german down there and all this german uh linguistics and it's like they it is like a bunch of them escaped down there and tried to start over and that's a hop skip and a jump from uh antarctica and so I definitely want to ask you, I want to come back to that because you helped on that other documentary, I think about the hollow earth, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that dovetails about Antarctica. So I want to get back to that. But first I want to ask you before I forget, since we're on the topic of just kind of the Nazi occult, um, you talk in your documentary about how obviously the Nazis were obsessed with occult sciences. They're looking for these artifacts um, but you talk some about this real society. So I want to just ask you a little bit more about that because you talk about how the real society had like these beautiful maidens, these women that had long hair. And um, but when they would get into these trances, they would start to do some crazy stuff. Tell us a little bit more about what you found in your research. Yeah, the, uh, the Vril Society was uh, made up of men and women, but there were two women that were part of the Vril Society, and these two women were part of what they called the Vril Maidens, which there were several of them, but only two were part of the Vril Society. The two that uh, were in the Vril Society was uh, Maria Orsic, and the other one, her name was Sigram, and they tasked these two women um, who were supposed to be good at uh, making contact with the dead. And they tasked them with making uh, contact with a dead SS officer that had been um, off doing something, gathering intel. And before he, he had a chance to get back to give the information that he had collected, uh, he was either killed or murdered or something. So they tried to reach out to him to get this information. And when they did, they made contact with some sort of entity that said it held from the Eldebaran system. And while they were in contact with this entity, they said that they started to excel ectoplasm, that there was like a uh, uh, this mist coming out of their nostrils and out of their mouths and their eyes rolled back in their head and they began automatic writing. And one started writing in an ancient Sumerian language and the other was writing in some sort of an ancient Templar language. And whenever they got done writing everything down and came out of their trance, it took them several years to to break this down and to uh, uh, translate it all. And one of them was the directions or the blueprints on how to build the Hanabu. And the other one was the directions on how to build the Diglaka. And there's actual footage that you can go and find. In fact, I'll send you the link later on um, of them doing a test flight of the Hanabu back in 1932 or 33 in Germany. They, they, they have it on video. You can actually see it. 
and this thing actually is levitating and flying around. Um, but the Glocka was something that they said was interdimensional, that this thing could jump between, it could go into the heavenly or demonic realms. It was some sort of interdimensional vehicle. And the Hanabu, was that like a bell-shaped craft? The Hanabu looks more like what everybody typically thinks of as a UFO, a saucer. And the other one looked like what? It was more bell-shaped. That's the okay. Diglaka. Yeah, it's. I, I've stumbled upon some of what looked like these authentic vintage photos of some of these craft the Nazis were creating. I mean, it's mind-blowing. This is the 30s. Yeah. And they have levitating like craft. I mean... When you look at the rest of the world, nobody else had technology like that. So, again, that connects back to what were they tapping into? And you're saying, and what a lot of others have said based on your research, as they were obsessed with the occult and tapping into this stuff, they were getting back these secrets, correct? Yes. In fact, I believe that's where almost all of this technology has come from. It's, it's fallen angel technology. Uh, it was destroyed in the flood. In fact, I think when I think of stuff like Star Wars and Star Trek, I think of the past. I don't think of the future. Uh, you know, that's that's ancient history. That's already happened. And that's the whole thing is, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. So we're just literally playing catch up to what they've already achieved in the past. OK, so let's talk about. Antarctica a little bit since we're on this topic of the Nazis. So again, the mainstream narrative is that Hitler commits suicide and and the Allies win win the war. And um, but again, even the History Channel's documentary, Hunting Hitler, says this completely other narrative, and which is no Hitler actually escaped. He lived for quite a while after the war. He was down in Argentina, and they had these secret bases in Antarctica. Now, being that you helped with that Hollow Earth uh, documentary, um, which I remember watching, and and that was fascinating because it dovetails around these secret bases in Antarctica, and it's not just hearsay because back in the day, was it the forties? Of uh, the U.S. set their sent their top Navy admiral Bird right down there yep. with this huge armada of it was like a, a warship armada of battle carriers why are they going to antarctica right after the war in the 40s if it was just a penguin expedition right mm -hmm. tell us more about that yeah the uh the it was admiral bird he took uh not only uh U united states naval forces down there with him he also had the uh british navy as well as the Australian Navy with him. So you had three different navies all go down there. There was 13 ships total. They had aircraft carrier, all sorts of stuff. And one of the ships that went down there on that expedition did not return. Um, in fact, uh, the, some of the people that came back had talked about these craft coming up out of the water. And they said that they fired some sort of, they, they referred to them as energy weapons, some sort of energy weapons. And they said that they cut through the ships like, like a knife going through uh, melted butter. And um, they said that uh, one of the ships actually was sunk. And uh, I mean, it's, it's to hear these people talking about, in fact, there was a transmission, if I remember correctly as well, that uh, South America picked up where, uh, Admiral Byrd had sent a report back saying that there were there were craft down there that could not only fly from, uh, um, I believe, city to city, but they could fly from pole to pole or something along those lines. And that got printed in the newspaper in South America. Uh, you can actually look that up. I'm not, so that's that's verifiable. But the fact that he had made this transmission back to the United States and that South America not only intercepted it, but printed it in newspapers. So they, they definitely encountered something. In fact, the thing was called Operation High Jump. And right. the, the fact that he went down there with as big a force as he did, but not only the United States, but had the British and Australia Navy with him, that begs the question, what the heck were they doing down there? And they were supposed to be there, if I remember correctly, they were supposed to have been there for like a year. And they came back after a couple of months. They didn't even spend the entire time down there that they were supposed to. So obviously something ran them up out of there. So this is shortly after the war. 
And again, they're not going down there with just these scientific vessels or fishing vessels. This is a battle fleet with yes. all kinds of uh, fighter jets on these craft, right? Yes. Yeah. So they had they had these battleships. They had fighter jets and or planes back then. And they're only down there for a couple months, like you said. Wasn't there also reports of these some kind of entities emerging from bases? I don't know necessarily if there was any of the, the that was the thing is they went down there looking for this space because like I said, Admiral Donuts had already made claims that he had made some sort of impregnable fortress. We know before all that they were down there what they called the New Swabins Land Expedition. And they had a, uh, a camp there called Base 411. So, I mean, they had already gone down there. They had already set up uh, bases and things like that. But like I said, according to Admiral Donuts and the fact that and the reason why I bring Admiral Donuts up, because he was one of the, the fleet commanders for their their Navy. And there was numerous. And when I say numerous, well, we're talking probably hundreds of. Um, uh goodness the uh, the submarines that went that just vanished completely off the face of the planet it's like where did all these submarines go because you know it's like yes you know some of them did get sunk especially the ones that were attacking like lusitania and all that kind of stuff but there was a vast majority of these that could hold up to hundreds of people in there that just completely vanished and it's like they were obviously spiriting Nazi scientists and people of importance away down to Antarctica on these submarines. And the fact that, you know, what was it? I believe that there was close to something along the lines, I think about 90,000 or 100,000 very important, prominent people uh, that just vanished, completely vanished. So the missing submarines, all the prominent people that just disappeared and Admiral Donuts making these boastful claims that, you know, hey, we got an impregnable fortress down there. So and, and and Admiral Donuts was with which country? Uh, he was uh, with one of the Nazis. Okay, he, yeah. he was uh, the Nazi naval fleet commander. So he was he had already bragged that they had um, sites down there. Yeah, and when you study Admiral Byrd, it's not like this was some Fruit Loop. This guy back in his day was he was like a Colin Powell of his day. He was Time Magazine Man of the Year, if I remember right. Yeah. And so he was a decorated war hero, the best Navy general that they send down there. And yeah, then he said crypti cryptic things about uh, what he encountered. And then if I remember right, upon his death, his uh, home was raided and everything, everything taken and put top secret, right? Uh, I believe the vast majority of it. Now, the uh, the diary that most people like to talk about that was actually that's actually in the um, uh, goodness, I can't remember if it's Utah. One of the universities has his diary, and that's the one that you hear people talking about, where he says that he was taken inside the Hollow Earth and that he had a meeting or face to face meeting with the master. And it's very fascinating when you get into that, when he's talking about the master that he met inside the hollow earth, because people like Roger Marnu, who has talked about uh, when he, uh, what was it? I think back in around, it was around the time right before World War II when uh, he was going to seances with his wife. And one of the guys that was there that night just approached him. He said, you know, what are you doing here? Why do you, what do you come to this? And he's like, well, my wife likes to come here. And he's like, but, you know, if I want real, if I want, if I want, if I, if I need something, he goes, I go direct to the source. He goes, if I want power, I go to the source. He said, look, he goes, we worship spirits. We worship Lucifer and his fallen angels. And they're just as beautiful as the day they were cast out of heaven. And our master was misunderstood. And that was the first time he started hearing them talking about the master. And that's what they refer to Lucifer as, as the master. So it's like, who was this gentleman that, that, that bird met with when he was taken into the hollow earth and that was the the thing that we were made we never got into that research or talked about that but that was one of the things that i wanted to to see in the film and i think it's very prominent because uh that is what they refer to him as it's the master you know even the last 10 15 years it's like all these world leaders make these special trips down to antarctica uh, I know John Kerry did a couple of years ago. The 
I think Germans, uh, Angela Merkel went down there. I mean, a lot of world leaders, why are they going to Antarctica? Um, and, and when you really stop, stop and think about it, it's like, do we really believe that, you know, it's like world peace is the hardest thing in the world to come by, but it magically happens in Antarctica, right? Where all the nations have decided to just share this, to just do do science research. Or is there something more going on, right? Is it actually ruled by proxy, whether it's by the U.S. or whatever? And the guys is, you know, scientific penguin research. Um, but a lot of people theorize there's not just maybe Nazi bases there, but there is ancient uh, ruins there. Researcher Linda Moulton Howe has done some extensive research. I actually watched her documentary re recently on, you know, secret ancient um, sites in Antarctica. You know, she seems to have, if you believe her, she's talked with a guy that was a pilot that flew over Antarctica to drop off some scientists and it's fa fascinating right it, again if true and as he's dropping them off and transporting them he looked down and saw massive ancient ruins and then at one point went into one and again if we're talking pre-adamic um architecture it was just massive like went on for massive... miles and miles and miles and that the there was no support columns in the massive gigantic rooms and that there was what two miles of ice on top that literally should have crushed this thing. He said that whenever you walked into another section of room that everything started lighting up and illuminating and that he could yeah. walk for miles and into another room and so on that, you know, it's, he said it was the biggest structure he'd ever been in and it just blew his mind. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Even the remote viewers saw a lot of crazy, weird stuff going on in Antarctica. And uh, Ingo Swan, he he was probably the one that got tripped out the most. Uh, he didn't like messing or uh, doing remote viewing on the, some of the structures as well as the uh, UFOs because he said that if he spied on them, that they would come and they would literally possess him, possess us. So, wow. Okay. Since you bring up remote viewing, I got to ask you about that because you definitely hit on that in the beginning of your film. How does remote viewing tie into, again, what these Nazis were doing with the occult? And then how is, for people who, you know, who know nothing about it, because it sounds pretty out there, how is the government supposedly trying to use that today? Well, um, it started out at uh, Stanford Research Institute. And, uh, the, and and that was where it really got bizarre when I started looking at it because the remote viewing thing tied in with the, what's going on at Skinwalker Ranch. Then, like I said, I started out on Skinwalker Ranch and got into all these other little topics. But uh, the uh, a vast majority or almost all the beginning people that were mixed up in remote viewing were at one time members of Scientology. So keep that in mind. And now we're not talking low level Scientologists. We're talking top of the, the you know, the upper epsilon, the, the cream of the crop. They were all OT7s. Ingo Swan, Hal Puthoff, both OT7s. Uh, Pat Price, who was the golden child at the Stanford Research Institute, he was OT3. So you got these people. And it started out what they were doing is that they were. Um, spying from a distance obtaining information that otherwise would be unobtainable so that's how it was started out was they wanted us to, to create psychic spies but it quickly morphed into something else and they started tapping into psychokinesis and they wanted to create psycho assassins that could kill from a distance and that's where it quickly started because like i said you know most people hear of mk ultra they hear of bon arc and all that but there was far deeper and darker um programs that they had going on and one of those that i talk about in the film was called mk often and this part of the the this one particular branch they got into uh the dark arts you know black magic satanic rituals um, they dealt with witches, um, just all sorts of stuff. In fact, they uh, were good. They uh, talked to a witch by the name of Sybil Leak, who was the head witch 
in the world back at that time. This this lady was so prominent and so well known that people like uh, Lovecraft, H.G. Wells, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Alistair Crowley, all these people used to go and visit her house and hang out and spend time with her when she was a child. Alistair Crowley started going there and hanging out with her when she was nine years old. And when she was 16 years old, he was still going by there and visiting her and reading her poetry and things like this. But she worked with the U.S. Air Force and Operation Often, and she got into some very disturbing stuff. And, and that was the thing. It's like they were very weirded out by a lot of the stuff that she talked about, but sometimes she would tell them things and it would just completely blow all their minds. You know, like where is she getting this information from? I think in chapter three of your documentary, you get into Skinwalker Ranch and you kind of start with the history of it, which I, I didn't actually know this older history. Can you, so can you start with kind of why Skinwalker Ranch start with that older history that you talk about and then how uh, was it Bigelow that ends up buying it? and the stuff that's happened and why it matters. Yeah. Um, the, uh, there was a, a older couple that lived on the ranch for a long time. I, I believe it was a period of about 70 years. And it wasn't until the husband had passed away. The wife was in a nursing home. And then when, eventually when she passed, her brother sold the property um, to a, a family called the Shermans. Well, the Shermans lived there for about 18 months and, from the first day that they moved in till the, the day that they left, they had nothing but bizarre supernatural things that happened out there. And the father, you know, Terry, he used to sit out there and watch these, this portal that would open in the sky. And he said that uh, there would be this portal that would just open up. He said it could be nighttime where he was at, but when this portal would open, it would be daytime on the other side. So it's like it was a window to another world, another dimension, whatever. But he could see things on the other side, and sometimes things would fly into it and things would fly out of it. And you know, he was always seeing craft out there, bizarre orbs, cryptids, um, just you name it. In fact, one day they had a gentleman that came out back when uh, the, the reports finally started to come out that there was like all the supernatural stuff going on out there. This gentleman had drove all the way out there to visit the property and said, I just want to go out and meditate in one of your fields or something or pray or something. So they take him out to the homestead too. He gets out, he sits there and he's just like meditating or praying. And all of a sudden they keep hearing this bell sound. And they're like, what's that? You know, I keep hearing it, but none of his cattle or any of his animals had any bells on them. So he didn't know what this the sound, where it was emanating from. And finally he said that he saw something moving in between the trees and then finally something broke away from the tree line and started running right up towards the man. Well, they didn't have a vernacular to describe what they were seeing, but they said it looked like a, like a heat mirage is the best way they could describe it. And um, this, whatever it was ran up right in front of the guy and just leaned over him and screamed and, or, or let out a roar. And they said it sounded like a, like a giant lion or bear or something they said it was it was the most piercing sound they'd ever heard and as quickly as it ran up and did this it quickly turned and ran away and they were you know time had went by one night they were sitting there and they were watching the movie predator and whenever they saw the thing come out of the jungle when it was had the camouflage on both his son and terry both pointed and started screaming they're like that's what we saw that's what it was and so he knew that there was some sort of cloaking technology as well out there on his property, that there's something running around that's obscuring and hiding itself, but that it could move faster than anything he'd ever seen. And that, you know, it, it freaked him out just seeing the craft out there, plus the things that were going on with some of his animals. They had had a young calf that had been mutilated. Him and his wife were out tagging the newborn calves, and he had just tagged that calf like 45 minutes before. And had walked off to another part of the pasture, but he wasn't very far away. Well, his dog started carrying on. And whenever his dog would not relent or calm down, he finally started going back over to that direction. And that's when he saw the mother running around limping on one of her or dragging one of her legs. So the mother had been injured and the calf had been completely eviscerated. I mean, all that was left was the, the meat 
down the spine and where its legs and stuff. And it was laid out like it was just presented. And that freaked them out because, like, like I said, they had just tagged it like 45 minutes before. Whatever did that, there's it, it did not have enough time and it was so precise. There was no blood anywhere to be found anywhere around the carcass or anything. So, I mean, just the sheer amount of weirdness that was going on out there. The, the wife used to come home and put all the groceries away and things like that. And then when she would step in the other room for like a few seconds. And when she'd come back out, all the groceries were back in the bag sitting on the, the countertop. And I mean, it was constantly, they hear things coming and going in and out of the house. In fact, when they moved into the house, there was bolts on the inside of the house and on the outside of the house. And they had big things where they used to chain up gigantic dogs right outside the house or bring them into the house. So they are like, what, what's what's going on here because the previous owners never said anything about anything weird going on there it wasn't until the shermans moved in but eventually what caused the shermans to sell the property was he had three hunting dogs and he finally one night uh there was a blue orb that appeared and it was coming closer and closer and finally he just let the dogs take off and chase after it well the the orb kept getting lower and lower and it was literally taunting them but also dragging them away into the these trees and once they disappeared out there behind the trees he said he heard three loud yelps and then he never heard anything else and it was too dark to go out there and go looking so he just decided to go out the next morning and whenever he got out there he found underneath one of the trees these three impressions in the ground where literally whatever it was it had incinerated his dogs and killed them and that was the last straw once that happened he decided i'm done i'm selling this and i believe it was um, somebody i can't remember exactly who it was brandon fugel talked about it in that clip uh, that i put in the film but uh, it was brought to the attention of um, bigelow because bigelow at the time all the UFO reports on the planet were going to him. So whenever a pilot or anybody encountered something weird and they filled out a report, those reports were going to Bigelow. So Bigelow decided that, you know, hey, whatever's going on out there might tie in with this whole UFO. In fact, one of the, the generals that um, he's friends with, that's part of his NITS team. I can't think of his name right the, off the top of my head, but... He was the one who flew out there with him when he bought the ranch and was talking, trying to talk him into it. And the Shermans, just so what we have a timeline, right? Were they living out there like in the fifties? Is that the kind of the timeline between the Shermans and Bigelow? Nineties in the oh, early nineties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Early nineties, I believe to the mid nineties. And that's when he bought it, but he didn't just buy a skinwalker ranch. This is, this is, another one of these things that, that eventually comes out for the deeper you dig um the ranch bradshaw ranch which is just as equally paranormal as skinwalker ranch he bought both of those ranches and they're not very far from one another but he bought them both at the same time and owned both of them for 10 years and like i said that's just the two we know about there's three others out there as well. So you got Bradshaw, you got Skinwalker, you got Blind Frog, you got Moonshadow, and you got Stardust. There's five paranormal ranches, and they all fall on a straight line. Fascinating. So the Shermans had it. The owners before them never really said much. But when the Shermans show up and take over this property, they notice some weird stuff like the door is bolted on each side. You said there was locks. So it's like, what are you trying to keep out? And some of the most incredible collection of, of pictographs in that area aren't far from Skinwalker Ranch, really, when you look at a map. And so, again, when we go back to the ancient side of things, like how how ancient is this property really and and who was here way before, right, that um, might have opened stuff up on this property? You can just click the link in the show notes to go straight to uh, Chad's documentary, Skinwalkers and Stranger Things of the Unseen Realm. If you can't click a link in a show note, just uh, search for that on Vimeo, like he said. And it's really easy to purchase. 
and download and just watch and enjoy and you're probably going to need a couple days because this thing is long and you're going to get your money's worth i'll say that um chad again remind me how can people follow you and stay up to date is it mostly just facebook uh, yeah my facebook channel is the chat uh, you know the facebook.com forward slash and then chad dot riley dot 12 brings up my uh, facebook page but um, yeah i'm also on youtube i have the uh, True Seekers Research channel as well with the trailer and a talk that I gave at Skyfall 2023 and um, any interviews that I start doing and from here on out I'll probably mirror those on there as well Awesome, well Chad, well done on the documentary, thanks for all the, not just hours but days, weeks, months and years of research you put into that and thanks for coming on today and uh, I hope to do this again in the future that's good. Appreciate it, brother.